This is the In Focus podcast from the Hindu. Welcome to the Hindu's In Focus podcast. I'm Zubeda Hamid, your host for today. This month, there's been a lot of excitement in the medical world over the approval given to treatments for diseases that are based on genome editing. What's this all about? In 2020, the Nobel Prize for Chemistry was given to two women scientists, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna, for their discovery of what was essentially a genetic scissors, a tool that allowed scientists to cut specific sites of a human being's DNA or to edit it by making minor changes. This tool, known as the CRISPR-Cas9 system, opened up opportunities to treat certain genetic or inherited disorders. Two of these are blood disorders, beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease, which up until now could only be cured through bone marrow transplants. Now, they can potentially be cured by editing the patient's own genes. Why is this of interest to India? In the union budget this year, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman had announced a sickle cell anemia mission to eliminate the condition by 2047. India is the second worst affected country in terms of predicted births with sickle cell anemia. But as exciting as these new developments sound, they will likely be extremely expensive and therefore probably unaffordable to many. And also the clinical trials have as of now only evaluated a small number of patients for relatively short durations and there is a need to constantly monitor the safety and efficacy of these therapies. So what exactly does genome editing involve? can its potential be expanded to treat far more diseases and what lies ahead in this field what are the concerns surrounding this could there be unintended consequences to genetic modifications we discussed these questions with dr vinod skarya a senior consultant at the vishwanath cancer care foundation and an adjunct professor at iit kanpur welcome to the hindus in focus podcast dr skarya it's a pleasure to be here So Dr. Skaria this a lot of excitement that's been doing the rounds in the scientific circles when it comes to gene editing especially because the US FDA and the UK's regulatory body both have approved of these technologies to treat certain diseases give us a little bit of a background about what gene editing technology is Now, gene editing technology broadly speaks about a, a, a number of technologies which enable us to edit that means it can it can add remove or change specific nucleotides of your genome sequence now these technologies are not new they have been there for uh, uh, decades now and they have been widely used in research laboratories to make very specific changes in the genome to study organisms but what has really caught the attention very recently is one of these gene editing technologies which is based on crispr cas has now pretty much reached the clinical scale with approvals of a uh, 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 gene editing technology using crispr cas for a very common uh, kind of disorders which we call as hemoglobinopathies tell us a little specifically about the crispr cas9 technology which has been approved for medicinal use now crispr cas technology is uh, originally antiviral or antibacterial phage defense mechanism in bacteria now this uh, this this uh, crispr locus uh, crispr essentially uh, is a short form uh, for clustered interspaced repeat sequences short palindromic repeat sequences these are dna elements in discovered in the archaeal genomes uh, they are prokaryotes early prokaryotes and uh, they were discovered in 1993 by spanish researchers now later such locus which have repeat elements have been discovered in a wide variety of bacterial species but it was not until uh, around very recently in 2005 that people knew that this repeat sequences had some function in bacteria and the function in bacteria is essentially to prevent them from being infected with viruses that infect bacteria which we call as bacteriophages Now what the system essentially does is it keeps a copy or a small segment of the bacteriophage inserted in its own genome and uses a protein which is called the cas protein which also occurs very very close to this repeat elements to 
now use this small fragment which has complementarity to the virus to cut them and therefore prevent them from being infected. Now, the CRISPR-Cas can and, and the CRISPR-Cas system can actually cause a double standard DNA cut was discovered only late in 2010. And uh, in quickly in 2012, uh, with the landmark paper, which sort of suggested that you can use this system in a very, uh, what you call, modulatable format to custom build uh, RNA and use the Cas protein to cut very specific regions in the genome uh, was something that really changed the, the practice of using this technology for genome editing. And quickly in the next year, in 2013, uh, of course, uh, people used this to demonstrate that you can do genomic editing in eukaryotic genomes, not bacterial genomes, but eukaryotic genomes. And this really was the landmark in using this technology for genome editing to cure many of the diseases that we today know about. So in 2020, for this very specific uh, landmark discovery, the Nobel Prize uh, in Chemistry was uh, given to the, the two lead authors, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna. So basically what this means is that something that the bacteria used as a defense mechanism is now being modified into a genetic scissors, correct? That's right. So the bacteria used this particular mechanism to protect itself from attacks against a virus and this has been modified and made into a tool that can edit or cut or change any part of the human genome. That's right. Right. So that is exciting and slightly science fiction-y at the same time. So tell us a little bit more about how it can really edit what goes on inside the human body. What can it do? Yeah, so the first generation of CRISPR-Cas proteins, uh, what, which is uh, now approved for therapy uh, for hemoglobinopathies, essentially makes a double standard cut. Uh, so you, in the DNA, you have two strands and it makes a cut on both the strands simultaneously. And this cut can be guided by what we call as a small RNA piece called the guide RNA along with the Cas protein and this particular case, the Cas9 protein. Now, what happens after this cut has been made is your cell has a repair mechanism and it tries to repair this specific cut. And while it tries to repair this specific cut, it can actually create a small deletion or it can introduce a specific, uh, a specific set of nucleotides into the, into the cut that you have created therefore editing it permanently. Now, so essentially what the CRISPR-Cas system does is to essentially sort of hijack your own DNA repair mechanism to create a, a, an error in the DNA and therefore making that error in the DNA can allow you to uh, make specific changes. Now, this comes with a lot of uh, caveats, the biggest caveat being the non-specificity of such cuts. While it does make cuts in intended sites with very good specificity, they could also make unintended cuts in other spaces or other regions in the genome. Uh, that's number one. And number two is the cut is not very specific in the terms that the repair mechanism can actually cause errors in the way you want to edit. And therefore, it used to be not very specific. But now with newer generation of CRISPR-Cas technology, you can actually make even single nucleotide changes, or you can even, for example, make epigenetic or methylation changes in the genome. Uh, they have not really reached uh, the, the clinical space yet. Some of them are indeed in clinical trials, but those are the things that we need to really uh, work uh, to, to uh, and see how it really comes to the clinical scale. So basically now we have a means of editing, cutting, changing, and creating certain things when it comes to the repair, whatever we want to do. How does this practically apply to diseases like inherited genetic disorders, such as what we talked about, sickle cell anemia and thalassemia? So hemoglobinopathies are probably one of the most prevalent of the genetic disorders. There are millions of people today who suffer from these disorders. 
Now, broadly in hemoglobin apathies, you have a defective hemoglobin gene. The hemoglobin gene is uh, necessary to carry oxygen around your body. Now, there are two large classes of these disorders. One is called sickle cell anemia. Now, sickle cell anemia is because of a very specific mutation in the hemoglobin gene, which causes the red blood cells to sickle. And, and of course, it has a difference in the oxygen affinity. The other more prevalent disorder is uh, what we call as thalassemia. Uh, we have both alpha and beta thalassemia. And beta thalassemia specifically is because of the defect in the hemoglobin B gene. Now, these disorders are of the red blood cells uh, or the RBCs, which carry oxygen across the human body. And these oxygen producing or oxygen carrying cells are uh, actually produced in the bone marrow of humans. And the, your bone marrow actually generates these cells uh, on a constant basis. And, and therefore, you have what we call as stem cells in this bone marrow, which constantly gives rise to red blood cells, uh, which are now put out into the bloodstream. And eventually, they die in approximately around 100, 120 days. Now, this genome editing technology essentially takes those stem cells from your bone marrow and edit them to change uh, the nucleotides of the hemoglobin B gene to either produce more of a particular kind of hemoglobin or change the hemoglobin G gene in terms of the mutation. Uh, there are multiple varieties of genomic technologies that today people use to either overexpress uh, one of the hemoglobins, which is normal or physiological, or change the sequence of a particular uh, defect. And then put it back into the bone marrow so that they can now produce RBCs with a physiological hemoglobin. Now, therefore, hemoglobinopathies are in many ways an exception because you are essentially talking about stem cells, which can now be edited and be put back into the system. But many of the genetic disorders that we sort of know about are not amenable to therapy in such a format. Like for example, if you talk about uh, neuronal cells or brain cells, they do not have much of stem cells to regenerate your brain. And by the time you're born, uh, a significant number of neurons are sort of differentiated and therefore genome editing becomes enormously difficult to regenerate lost or defective neurons in your body. So disorders which are caused by tissues which can regenerate and or replace your, your defective tissue today are probably one of the best amenable tissues for genome editing. And the examples, of course, would be bone and bone marrow. It could be, for example, skin. And many of these conditions which affect regenerative tissues or tissues which can regenerate, like, for example, liver. For example, metabolic disorders, which, uh, which, uh, which are because of cells in the liver, are today amenable to genome therapy. But a wide variety of disorders which are not... Uh, which cannot be regenerated or tissues which cannot be regenerated are today not yet amenable to genome therapy. So what this means is that diseases that have, as you said, the potential for stem cell usage where you can modify it and then re-put it back into your body can potentially be treated with gene editing technology, but not, not something like cells that affect your brain, correct? That's right. So doctor, this is exciting for those with inherited blood disorders because it does away completely. You don't then need a donor. Is that right? You can do it with your own bone marrow cells. That's right. So tell us a little bit more about how this would potentially apply. In India, we have, as uh, Nirmala Sitaraman in, her, in the budget this year said, we have now started a sickle cell anemia eradication program in India because it is a fairly common disorder over here along with thalassemia. Would this have potential implications in India, such technology? Yeah, so today the, what the government has sort of announced is a program to sort of diagnose uh, hemoglobinopathies, very specifically sickle cell anemia. Uh, in, in regions where sickle cell anemia is of 
high endemicity. So there are some populations in India or some regions in India where sickle cell anemia is extremely prevalent. Uh, and they're prevalent because of a number of other factors. Uh, the program essentially envisages screening of individuals uh, who would have sickle cell anemia and therefore be able to diagnose them. And one of the ways to screen such uh, disorders is to look at abnormal hemoglobin uh, because it's a protein which is abnormal. It can have different physical and biochemical properties and therefore you could screen for them and detect them. The next part of that is to essentially confirm them and confirmation typically involves sequencing of that particular gene, in this particular case, hemoglobin beta or hemoglobin B, and sequencing hemoglobin B and identifying the specific genetic mutation, you can identify individuals who have sickle cell disease and also who are carriers for sickle cell disease. Now, there are two implications for the screening procedure. The first implication is that you would identify uh, people who are carriers for this disease. Now, carriers for this disease necessarily means that of the two copies of genomes that you have inherited from either of your parents, if you have only one copy which is abnormal, uh, and when you marry another person who is also a carrier for this disease, that means of the two copies of that particular person, one copy is defective, then your child would have a one in four probability of having two copies which are abnormal. Now, if you have two copies which are abnormal, then you have a disease, what you call as a sickle cell disease. But if you have only one copy abnormal, then you don't manifest the disease in its severity. But in sickle cell anemia, for example, it protects you from severe forms of malaria. So in many ways, what we need to keep in mind is that screening would provide us understanding about who are carriers, that means one of the two copies who are abnormal, and who are diseased, which means where you have two of the two copies which are abnormal. Now, once you understand the spectrum, you would be able to offer what we call as genetic counseling to people who are carriers. And by offering genetic counseling to carriers, you can make them understand what is the chance that your offspring would develop the disease. You can do multiple things today to either prevent the disease by, for example, uh, enabling detection of the disease prenatally, uh, not not very accurately though, but uh, and not not very essential though. But uh, in many cases, you can diagnose them at at birth, and if you can diagnose them at birth, then today the gold standard of treatment is probably to do uh, uh, medication, or in severe cases, what people suggest is to do a bone marrow transplant. Now, what genome editing comes into picture is. Uh, to sort of have an, a transplant alternative provided it becomes very cheap and affordable for people to take it. At this point in time, probably it is not a very cost effective approach to replace uh, either medical, medi medical management or bone marrow transplant, but probably in the future as technology becomes much better, it would, it would probably replace uh, the bone marrow transplant part and in the future probably might become the gold standard of treatment as they become available across the country. Apart from the cost factor, Dr. Skaria, it's also an extremely new treatment, correct? Do we still need to wait a few more years before we fully understand perhaps its long-term effects? Absolutely. So what the clinical trial sort of shows is that the safety and efficacy is uh, as good as today's gold standard, which is hematopoietic stem cell transplant, what we call as bone marrow transplant. The long-term safety and efficacy is something that we need to be really cognizant about. And that therefore, the clinical trial for these drug has also been followed up on a longer period of time. Uh, so what the approval was actually based on a very small number of individuals uh, at, on an interim basis because it provided as much efficacy and safety uh, on a short term, uh, as much as uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant or bone marrow transplant. So surely the long-term safety and efficacy of these therapies have to be monitored 
uh, and looked up in, in close detail uh, because at least for a similar kind of therapy, uh, like for example, the CAR T cell therapy, which is widely used in cancer, there's emerging evidence that there could be long-term uh, safety issues uh, for such therapies. So this is something that we need to have a close watch upon and but nevertheless that doesn't necessarily mean that we should be pessimistic about these technologies because these technologies are becoming more accurate every every passing day. Talk to us a little bit about the controversies surrounding this doctor. So while it is exciting there have been some concerns raised in terms of is there a possibility of this being misused? For instance, in 2018, there was a Chinese researcher who said that he had used CRISPR-Cas9 to create gene-edited twins who would, who, where he had modified a gene to ensure that they did not get the HIV-AIDS disease. So what, is, what, is the, what are the concerns around this? Yeah, so every, every single technology that we use has a potential of being misused. Now, that is really not the caveat of the technology per se, but that is a caveat of the society which uses the technology or the set of people who use those technology. And like every other medical technology which could now be misused, uh, for that matter, even as simple things like a surgical blade can be misused, that doesn't really mean that you should stop people from using it for the legitimate purposes. And therefore, I think what is really important is the legislation to prevent misuse of such technologies. Now, technologies will surely evolve and, uh, of course, uh, move by leaps and bounds and improve our capability to treat diseases. But it also comes with the caveat that these technologies in the wrong hands could actually uh, make things go really, really wrong. Now, the only way you can prevent misuse of technology is to have legislation and legislation at both at national level and probably at an international consensus uh, between countries on what these technologies should be used for and what these technologies should not be used for. Because the power of editing your genome could essentially mean that you could change the genome forever and even to an extent that you can change a genome which now becomes transmitted to the next offspring. In other words, for the first time in the humankind, you have the possibility to change your genomic destiny by rewriting your genomic code. So that comes with, of course, a lot of excitement, but of course, we should keep in mind that uh, we need to have adequate legislations to ensure that it doesn't really fall into the wrong use. Last question before we sign off, Doctor. Talk to us a little bit about the ethics of it. While, as you said, for the right use, when you look at it in terms of actually treating a disease, you obviously want to do it because you want to help people who are suffering. But what are the ethics surrounding messing with one's human genome? Yeah, I don't think we should really call it as messing with a human genome because uh, uh, if you really put in numbers, there are around 300 million people in this world who suffer from a rare genetic disorder. Now, many of these rare genetic disorders today remain undiagnosed or underdiagnosed. And in many ways, they do not have appropriate treatment options. And as I said, these are genetic conditions that would also mean that they would run in families or communities. And especially in the scenario of India, where we have a large number of endogamous communities, which are essentially communities who marry uh, between members of the same community, they would have a large prevalence of one or the other genetic condition. Now, this would necessarily mean that the millions of people around the world today who do not have a therapy possible, and the therapy is today not possible because it is not viable to produce a, a, a therapy for many of these rare conditions. Because just because they're too rare, and doesn't really make economic sense. A lot of pharmaceutical industries are not into the business of making drugs for rare diseases, of course, with few exceptions. Now, does that mean that individuals with genetic diseases should not have any hope in the future? Probable answer is uh, in genome editing technologies because the utility of genomic editing technologies 
to make it very specific for a particular mutation provides the advantage that you can probably create designer therapeutics in the future because each of these individuals would have a very specific genetic mutation that could now be corrected at scale using the technologies that we have in hand. Of course, we may not have these technologies today to make designer therapies, but that is essentially the future uh, that we need to be looking forward to. Now, this would necessarily mean that a wide variety of genetic conditions could now be amenable to treatment, and that would necessarily mean that a wide number or a wide spectrum of the human population could now access therapies which are award, uh, affordable and accessible to them. And I think that is one thing that we need to keep in mind. But of course, in, in the wrong hands, this would mean that you could edit genomes for things that are not really important. Like, for example, you could edit things to change your eye, for example, uh, or the color of the eye. You could change the color of your skin. You could change the color of your hair. Now, it's really the question that you should, should you use these technologies eventually to do that? The answer probably lies in the community and the society on what they think is important at that point in time. Because ethics is something that is not fixed or not written in stone. It is generally the consensus of the society or the community that uses the technology for a specific application. So when the technology tomorrow becomes extremely, uh, what you call specific and precise, I think there would be a wider, more applications beyond human diseases to make better uh, traits out of humans, which may or may not be approved or uh, recognized. Uh, and there may not be a consensus even globally on the use of this technology. So therefore, I think what's really more important is a dialogue to start between stakeholders on what they think are the priorities of using this technology going forward. But of course, in the future, this would necessarily mean that we would be able to use this technology to change our destiny uh, in many ways of genomic destiny forever. And of course, that would mean a lot of hope to patients with genetic diseases, millions of such patients, but that would also mean that we might use this for very trivial applications with long-term implications. Thank you so much for speaking to us today, Dr. Skaria. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. In Focus will be back soon with analysis of the biggest news issues. In the meantime, you can find our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher and other platforms. Just search for In Focus by The Hindu. We'll see you soon.